Rusty Quill presents. I'm Joe Hamia. And I'm James Walton. We're here to tell you that the Booker Prize is launching a brand new podcast. Each week, Joe and I will be plucking novels from the Booker archives to review, ponder, and in some cases, almost fight about. Almost. <laughs> we'll be having a gossip about all things Booker. Sometimes with the help of special guests. Give me the good stuff, James. What's it called? We've decided to call it uh, the Booker Prize Podcast. <laughs> and it'll be available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So look out for Booker Prize Podcasts and please do follow the show. If you're listening to this podcast, you must recognize the value of asking questions. At Aramco, our questions help us engineer a better future. How can today's resources fuel our shared tomorrow? How can we deliver energy to a world that can't stop? How can we deliver one of the fuels of the future? How can we sow curiosity to harvest ingenuity? To learn more about how innovation drives us forward, visit aramco.com slash powered by how. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club. I'm your host, Tyler Bell, writer, creator, author, uh, one man army behind the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Dark Fiction podcast. If you are here only to listen to the regular episodes, you can go ahead and skip this one. The HLCs are non canon, non fiction episodes um, that you do not have to listen to in order or even at all to enjoy the greater story. Uh, of the West Side Fairy Tales universe. You can just bail on those and just come right back here. Um, if you're bored and you want to listen to some additional content later. Today, we are continuing our interview series with uh, Chantelle Ryan. She is an Australian independent video game developer uh, currently working on a title called Dark Web Streamer, which we will be talking about at length when the interview starts. It's about an uh, hour and a half long. And uh, one of my favorite interviews, there are some minor, minor, minor audio issues during it, uh, but I think it's all pretty much good. It just comes with talking to somebody in Australia, literally almost perfectly the opposite side of the world from where I am in America. But hey, we made it happen. Um, It's a great interview and that's coming up shortly. But before we get into that, just some quick housekeeping stuff. First off, sorry, I'm not getting as much content out as I like. Um, I remember, too, when this podcast used to be uh, monthly on running like running like clockwork but also during that time i had literally nothing else going on um and that was also my my best my best years were during covid so you know you can be very productive when you literally can't even leave the house uh that said this season is bar none the most difficult uh to put things together but i really like the way they sound and so there is going to be more time between episodes than in any other season just because i want them to sound good and if you're a new fan listening uh way down the line and it's like 2027 just be just be like man i wonder what it was like sitting a month or so uh, a month or more between episodes of 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 scars and time or not scars and time of uh sin carriers and and you'll never know you'll never know the struggle of being a day one but shout out all my day ones as per usual and uh just don't just uh, just in case you guys uh, forget or you weren't thinking about it um if you want to support the, the show and if we can get enough support considerably more support than I can put these out faster because I could probably like hire somebody to help me. Um, unfortunately the Patreon has been getting kicked in the shins lately guys. Um, sorry. Um, but if you want to try to make this podcast better, we're trying to have a goal of getting to a hundred patrons, uh, just a hundred patrons by the end of the year. So we're currently pushing, uh, about 55, 60 patrons, uh, roughly month to month. People come in, people go out, but Hey, if you got it, just a dollar, just a dollar to keep us on the map. We're trying to get up to a hundred patrons. Please consider doing that. Patreon.com slash Westside Tyler. You can get access to all kinds of cool stuff, merch, stickers, books, um, all kinds of crazy stuff. If you want to give a little bit more and, uh, and really try to help the podcast take off. So consider doing that if you enjoy all this stuff. And if you don't, I don't, I don't, why the fuck are you here? (laughs) What the hell? (laughs) <laughs> but uh, no, if you don't have any cash to help us out, that's fine. Please just uh, uh, pay me back for the content in a, in, in, a, in a sort of way by sharing stuff out there or just listening to the commercials. And uh, yeah, if you hate commercials, hey, man, 
consider paying for the podcast. It is online at patreon.com slash Westside Fairy Tales. Um, but yeah, I've been extremely busy. I'm not just slacking off and hanging out out there. Um, that's one of the biggest changes over the last few years is this year. I've got shit going on, man. I'm out there. I'm out there doing stuff. And it's been uh, it's been breakneck for me, unironically, uh, for the last probably like for two years, honestly. But like for the last few months, it's been kind of relentless. I have been writing on occasion. Thank God. I finished a few short stories. So if you're uh, in your mind, if you're supporting the podcast and like saying like, hey, I want him to be making shit. I assure you, I have been making shit. I think one of the biggest reasons I've been down lately um, and kind of like mentally uh, jacked up is because I've put so much fucking content like into existence that hasn't been released. It's all sitting there. I mean, it's driving me fucking nuts. There's multiple books, uh, multiple books, multiple short stories. Um, um, There's a little bit of a comic kind of thing that I'm working on. And some other stuff that I want to get going and the card game, the card game, which I need to kickstart still, but I just need to have enough time to like make sure the Kickstarter uh, pops off the right way. You know, you can't do those things half assed. I'm doing all this stuff behind the scenes. Uh, we just switched the book, uh, my, or my first release, The Eyes Beneath My Father's House over from uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP to Ingram Spark, which was a uh, big ass pain in the ass uh, just to get done and make sure it was done right but now that that's finished which and that took two basically two full weeks of working with ingram spark and doing research and purchasing things i had to buy my own isbn numbers and stuff and that's expensive um these are a lot of back-end costs and things um but I needed to do that so I could print good books because we tried to print books through KDP and they were all printed completely wrong, bent covers, broken, broken covers, uh, all of the pages in the books that we ordered a hundred, which is like almost a thousand dollars of, of, of investment capital. Um, all of them were printed crooked, like literally, uh, like a five degree offset on every page, like unsettling to look at, like you'd get seasick trying to read this shit and we had to send all of those back so that's just all time of getting books in sending books back getting books in sending them back doing all this stuff online and uh, that's so that i can sell these things when i start going to conventions again um in this upcoming pre-halloween convention season which starts literally this weekend at imaginarium so if you're at imaginarium July 14th through 16th um, in Louisville, Kentucky. If you guys want to come out and see me, please stop by. Say hi. I will have books and T-shirts for sale, and I'll be signing basically fucking everything. So pop on pop on through, kiddos, and, uh, and you can say hi to me. I'll have a booth there. I think a tiny one. I think I'm like a tiny little creator's alley booth. But hopefully I fucking, hopefully I, I get my name out there. Who, who knows? Who knows? But um, the biggest thing that I've been working on, and it's going to be the thing that's like absorbing all of my time going forward, is the release of my debut novel, West by God, through Henlo Publishing out in eastern Kentucky, Henlo Press. Uh, That's H-E-N-L-O. I really want you guys, if you have a second, if you like this podcast at all, please go follow Henlo Henlo Press at uh, Facebook.com you know, and, and Instagram, but that's Henlo press H E N L O. We are going to be doing a Kickstarter launch for the, uh, for, for West by God so that we can basically get seed capital to sell you guys books and then print other books. Basically, if you buy a book from the Kickstarter, that's going to give us the ability to print another book to sell to somebody in person. So you're, it, it's really going to be a big thing in helping uh, West by God get off the ground for launch. So please follow Henlo. And then when the Kickstarter comes out, follow the Kickstarter as well. That's going to be starting actually 
uh, the weekend after next. And I'm going to be pimping it, primping it, pushing it out there like you wouldn't fucking believe. Um, because this is probably one of the most important things. So if you've never done anything for the West Side Fairy Tales, you've been hanging out, you've been listening in the background, you've been like, oh, maybe one day I'll do a Twitter, maybe one day I'll do a review, one, maybe one day I'll do this, I'll do that. This is the one thing I really need from you guys. I really need you to get involved with this Kickstarter. You don't have to put down money, but please pay attention to it. Like it share it. If you're a Kickstarter fiend, absolutely get in there and, and share these things. Um, but this is going to be one of the big things. This is like the launch. This is the moment. If you guys have always been talking about like, man, I wish fucking West side fairy tales was bigger. I wish Tyler was bigger. This is bigger. Um, the book is not going to be just an indie launch. You know, it is, it is through a publisher. It's not one of the big four traditional press people. I know that I think it's down to big three. Unfortunately, as I've said before, my last name's not King and, uh, whoever I am as a person is not the, sh- the soup du jour for selling books right now. If, 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 uh, slightly insane, uh, PTSD adult veterans becomes like the thing that everybody wants to see from an Oprah's book club listing in the near future. You know, if that becomes a thing that people are asking for, then yeah, I'm going to fucking pop off, I guess. Cause that's like what I've been set up for. But this right here, this big thing on Kickstarter, a big indie push trying to get these in front of reviewers. If you have felt somebody that likes the reviews, they uh, or that writes reviews, even if they're small, if they're big, tell them about me. Tell them to send a request to Henlo for an arc. We will send out advanced review copies. We are going to send out advanced review ebooks. The entire thing is going to be a massive, like a real full level launch of a book. If you guys really show up with the big support and we can fucking pop this thing off, if we can make this fucking happen, um, I am going to be doing uh, a, 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 a audio book along with it. I will read the story to your fucking fucking ear holes. It's going to be great. So please, this is the big thing. This is the one time I'm going to be waking up. I'm going to be going out there and I'm going to be getting it. Please, please, please follow Henlo on facebook follow henlo on instagram share their shit make them big enough so that when they cast their net we catch the fucking earth that is our goal west siders i fucking love you i do not ask for stuff like this often normally i am dolores melancholic uh little little fucking uh, writer baby hiding in my corner whining about how the world is not fucking fair to me this is the time I'm going to be like every fucking jackass I see on YouTube. Come on, West Side Army. Let's get together and let's make this happen. <laughs> please, 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 though, do do this stuff for me. Um, and uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to move on to uh, the interview with Chantal. So please sit back, relax and enjoy probably my favorite interview. Like I said earlier, um, that I've done in the interview series so far, which isn't a knock against the other people. They were so great that uh, this standing out is really just what makes it uh, stand out so much. So uh, here we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Chantal Ryan to the podcast uh, all the way from Australia today. Uh, Chantel, how are you doing? Would you like to introduce yourself? You're a, uh, a video game creator. Yes. Hi. Uh, I am Chantal Ryan, and I am the studio founder of We Have Always Lived in the Forest, where we are making the psychological horror RPG streamer simulation game, Dark Web Streamer. Uh, I do a lot of things on the game. I do the game design, most of the writing and the art and AI programming and a whole bunch of naughty, naughty things. I am also an anthropologist and um, I occasionally do some academic writing on a whole bunch of things, but of interest to you guys, uh, I really love to write about horror. That's uh, that's awesome. Yeah, you have a you have a pretty expansive CV. Um, you just won a, a forty under forty award in your um, discipline, um, and actually are just coming off of uh, off of that night. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> that hanger, but yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, before I before I even um, hop into it a hundred percent, you have a rabbit as your uh, profile picture. Do you have rabbits? I do not, but I would love, love, okay. love to have a rabbit. I am a big fan of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And so the white rabbit chasing it down the rabbit hole is kind of my thing. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, we, have, we have two white rabbits and one black one. We're, we're rabbit it's people incredible. over here. It's awesome. I have a rabbit envy right now. <laughs> yeah. They're they're persnickety. They're 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 very much like their uh, their fictional counterparts. One of the most accurately depicted animals. <laughs> <laughs> you should really like take at least one of the white ones outside and like let them go and then follow them and see if they take you to a hole. Oh my Just gosh. for science, for sure. <laughs> I, I do actually very occasionally see like rabbits around where I live and I always stop whatever the hell I'm doing and I will follow that rabbit. I'm just like praying like today is the day. Yeah. <laughs> today is my Alice day. Now, if you saw him just pull out that pocket watch, that would be the moment, right? <laughs> I'm always like just a little bit waiting for it. So um, that is, uh, if you know, I'm kind of just seeing it from the outside. Uh, your games uh, that you make, I'm a little bit familiar. I haven't been able to play them just yet. I mean, obviously, I can't play Dark Web <laughs> Streamer. Uh, but Unhome, I believe, is the first game that you not necessarily made, but released via Ichio? Yes, absolutely. And that's got a very um, down-the-rabbit-hole vibe just looking at it. You, you care to talk <laughs> about uh, Unhome? Yeah, um, so Unherm was a game that we kind of made really soon after Dark Web Streamer's kind of initial development. Uh, it like this whole kind of crazy game dev journey started as me and one of my good friends, Ryan Truk. Uh, we were actually working on a tabletop role playing game inspired by Phasmophobia. Oh, yeah. Another great horror game. I'm, I'm a and, fan. Phasmophobia. Oh, great. it's so good, dude. It's, it's so much of what I love, uh, especially as an anthropologist. It's just absolutely fascinating to drop people into a haunted house and see how they react. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we actually didn't have any experience in making a game. Neither of us. And we, being insane humans, were like, yeah, how hard could it be? I'm sure we could do this. Uh, so we started working on Dark Web. And then, like, maybe six to eight weeks into development, uh, we saw this indie horror game jam. And we were like, you know what? It's, it's a two-week game jam. What might actually be really cool is if we go make another game and just kind of like do a thing that we can finish and release because we could tell Dark Web Streamer was about to be like a multi-year marathon. Uh, so yeah, we jumped into it with Axel Teari, who uh, last I heard was working as a narrative designer over at Zaum. And we stumbled over a composer on Discord um, who now works with us, George Evans. He's now the lead composer on Dark Web Streamer. And actually, a funny story about him. Uh, he posted his music reel in the Game Jam server, and it was so good that I thought he had stolen the tracks. And I actually <laughs> messaged him. And I was like, hey, look, this might be weird, but I really... I'm questioning whether you made those, but if you did, like, I would be interested in working with you, but I'm going to need you to, like, prove to me that you made these tracks. <laughs> That's and, awesome. Like, God bless him for, like, not just giving me the middle finger. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> he like actually the, went and, like, screen recorded everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, oh. So it's a great, you know, I'm like, you were so good that I just thought you were a sham. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we do. We, we work with him now as a hell of a grind um, on Herm. But yeah, essentially on Herm is a hearkening back to your old school point and click adventure games. I call it a, uh, it's a domestic gothic tale. 
uh, or suburban gothic, as we called it in the description. And it's kind of uh, just dumps you in the middle of a really strange setting in this dilapidated house. And what you do as the player is you're kind of trying to figure out what is going on, what's what's happening with this woman, what's happening with this house. Um, and kind of the thing I'm proudest of, well, I'm proud of two things in the game. One of them would be a spoiler to tell you, but, uh, the game is about an Agora verb. That is the protagonist. And so something as a game designer, I really wanted to engage with is, uh, like empathetically communicating the experience of an Agora verb. And agoraphobia, for those who don't know, is essentially a phobia about leaving your house. Um, so like the safety of your home. And so I kind of came up with this panic attack mechanic um, in which when you confront things that are really kind of triggering to the protagonist, you go into this panic attack sequence where you're trying to like... Uh, keep control of your thoughts by typing while the screen starts going crazy and the letters stop flying away. Well, that's awesome. That reminds me of a uh, a real like a real niche game that not many people remember anymore from the GameCube. Uh, oh, I cannot, I cannot for the life of me. I'm, my brain just tried to tell me it was Amnesia: Dark Descent, but it was an <laughs> old Cthulhu game, um, and it had it was absolutely trippy. And when you were walking around, just even the normal things, kind of like a you know, you'd fight some stuff, but every time you looked at something, you got a little bit more insane. And the game mm. would lose its mind um, and it would do stuff where there was a, a, a notorious part where it would actually show you like um, your uh, load screen. And when you were trying to like get off of it, it would just input any any input that you put would make it look like it was just automatically selecting delete save file. Like you were deleting your save file on that's accident incredible. and it oh caused people uh, an extreme amount of distress back in the day. But that's, <laughs> that's such an oh, awesome this mechanic. This kind of stuff I love. I just, how, how do you, uh, I really like kind of fourth wall game design. I really appreciate it too. How, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you plan for something like that? Doing like a fourth wall, um, you know, kind of putting somebody that deep in while also maintaining the structure of the game, you know, uh, so that it doesn't kind of just all fall apart around them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's actually a really interesting question. It's something that is really important to me uh, because the way that I design, I have come to realize is different to kind of the standard prescription of design something you'll hear a lot is kind of game mechanics first you figure out like what the game is and like how it will play mechanically and then you kind of like try to fit story in like shove it in this pre-existing jigsaw puzzle uh whereas i am a writer by discipline um that's kind of my core identity when you peel everything back, I've always been a horror writer. And so for me, everything is about story and everything is there to serve story. And so when I design, I am absolutely story fast. And when I say story fast, uh, what I really mean is the experience of being within story. So like asking questions like what, is a story and what does a story do for us? Why do we care about it? Why do we engage with these things? What is it we're actually looking for within story, within narrative? And so kind of like things I've hit on is we as people, when we engage with stories is we're looking for meaning and we're looking for connection to other human beings. We're looking for new perspectives. We're looking to be understood in ways we don't feel understood by other people. And so when I'm designing, I take a really kind of like story and experience fast perspective. So with Unherm, um, I kind of conceived of this like setting that was going to feel very strange and dreamy and it was going to feature an agoraphobe who 
was dealing with like a very particular issue that I knew would be slowly revealed over the course of the game. And so I essentially went, okay, if we are playing as an agoraphobe, what will actually make us feel like that person? How can we make the player connect in the most empathetic way to this person, uh, to the experience of being this person, which is the same kind of question I ask myself when I'm writing, Mm -hmm. just a kind of a flat story or a linear story. So yeah, that was kind of where our most unique mechanic, the panic attack mechanic was born from, was really like just engaging with the question of, okay, like what are troubles? What are the struggles of being an agoraphobe? So did a lot of research into that. I think research is really important when we're seeking uh, to communicate authentic narratives And yeah, so like panic attacks came up kind of more than anything. So I was like, okay, this is like the most important thing that we need to connect the player with. We need them to understand this like sense of like anxiety and fear and sense of impending death and doom and that agoraphobes often talk about. And yeah, so I kind of was like, all right, so we need to incorporate things like tunnel vision. Uh, that are often listed as a symptom. We need like this kind of like loss of control of thoughts. Uh, We need all these different little components. How do we present that in kind of one game mechanic? So what ended up being born was you kind of have this timer and your vision begins to slowly tunnel in toward the middle of the screen. And you have this kind of like sentence of a thought Um, But it starts kind of squiggling away and you have to try to like capture the calm thought before the like panic thought takes over you. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That sounds like something gives somebody a panic attack. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I was really proud of it because that was kind of the feedback we got where people like, wow, like it really felt like I was about to die in real life. Um, You know, um, it pleases my horror right a (laughs) heart. (laughs) <laughs> and uh you know um i obviously i haven't necessarily played dark web streamer but um just watching or or, or basically going through the feed for dark web streamer um i can kind of tell that uh, as you were saying a little bit earlier this sort of um interpreter interpersonal connection um and sort of the intensity of uh you know how people perceive you and how you might be perceived if you put yourself out there Uh, That seems like it's very important. Um, Dark web streamer is about a a literal, a web stream, a web streamer, uh, if I'm, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the part that makes me the most unsettled is something that um, I have to do is, you know, even though I'm, uh, there's not enough letters in the alphabet to say the list I'm on, I'm below (laughs) Z, you know, Uh, even I have to face that, um, you know, like, Hey, I'm putting myself out there. I'm going to run into people and that unnerving, aspect of uh anonymous interaction on the internet you know because they're just there now they're in your house on your phone yeah. on your on your screen there's it's not like you know you can see someone down the street and even just looking at it it really like made me unsettled i was like i don't know if i want to play <laughs> a game where the, the game's trying to make me nervous about a thing that makes me nervous although i really really <laughs> do want to play it um and, and so could you tell me a little bit about dark web streamer Hey, sweetie, what do you think of our new car from Carvana? Think it can handle our busy family? Well, we have seven days to see. First, we can take the scenic route to the beach and stargaze through the moonroof. We'll see if your drums fit in the trunk. Then we can pick up mommy's friends and check out that leg room. And we should really visit grandma. She's getting up there. That's like... A whole lifetime in seven days. And like one busy family. With our seven-day money-back guarantee, you can confidently shop for cars 100% online. Visit Carvana.com for all terms and conditions. We'll drive you happy at Carvana. I'm Jay Hamia. And I'm James Walton. We're here to tell you that the Booker Prize is launching a brand new podcast. Each week, Joe and I will be plucking novels from the Booker archives to review, ponder, and in some cases, almost fight about. Almost. (laughs) We'll be having a gossip about all things Booker. Sometimes with the help of special guests. Give me the good stuff, James. What's it called? We've decided to call it uh, the Booker Prize Podcast. (laughs) And it'll be available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So look out for Booker Prize Podcasts and please do follow the show. Yeah, 
Uh, absolutely. And yeah, you absolutely hit on kind of the most important thing for me um, is everything I make is about birth trying to kind of like enhance the sense of human connection. So from like one person to another um, and also helping us understand more about the ways in which we're connecting or not connecting to other people. Um, and sir, so you mentioned kind of identity uh, just before, and I think it's really important to bring up that I am a trained anthropologist. So I have a degree in anthropology as well as English. Uh, so my two kind of great loves are studying people and making things about them based on their studies. And so Doc Webb's dream, uh, uh, I mentioned before that we were working on a tabletop role-playing game and that kind of warped into Doc Webb's dream uh, or at least set the foundation for like the Doc Webb idea. Um, and I guess I'll start from there. The way we, like, uh, the way Doc Webb's dream came to be was... Uh, I was actually watching a movie and it's really interesting to me because I have spoken to so many horror movie buffs about this movie that inspired Doc Web, and no one has ever seen it except mm -hmm. for me. So now I'm kind of wondering whether it still exists. Uh, but it was called Dibbuk Box, The Haunting of Chris Chambers, I think it was. I think I've seen that from like the uh, mid 2000s. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like an exorcism movie, isn't dear. it? Um, I couldn't tell you. I'm very bad at paying attention to dates and details. It's about a YouTuber, uh, and it's a found footage film. So it's actually shot as uh, like a series of YouTube videos that this huh. YouTuber has recorded of himself. And he's ordered a haunted dibbuk box off the dark web and the first really interesting thing about this was actually that there are some real things or they at least exist as orderable items on the internet i had no idea there was this whole kind of subculture of haunted items that you can buy on the internet and people actually really do on YouTube, if you go look it up, they do unboxings of like weird things they bought on the dark web or, you know, supposedly on the dark web. Uh, so I was really fascinated by this idea. But then I was really interested by the second thing that happened, which was you saw this YouTuber kind of like get this box and the actor did a really great job of portraying the sense of dread that he had when interacting with this box mm -hmm. that was currently sealed. And you could tell he started to have this internal dialogue of, it, should I really open this? Because like this feels real and this feels dangerous and this feels like a really bad idea. Um, but he had also promised his audience that he was going to unbox the creepy dark web box. And so actually the first real serious story I ever wrote was this kind of Victorian Gothic story in which a doctor visits a patient at their home and they have these two chairs in this huge old room and the doctor can't see behind him. There's just a lot of space in this big empty sitting room. And uh, I was interested in social decorum and the way that sometimes we endanger ourselves or we ignore our, instincts, our instincts in order to preserve social decorum. So... Basically, the doctor starts to hear weird, suspicious, creepy noises behind him. And the patient, this creepy old woman he's talking to, is also acting a little bit bizarre. But because they're in direct conversation, he never wants to turn all the way around and look behind him because he anticipates it would be very rude. Um, 
it's just something about breaking eye contact to just whip around and look behind you when you're in someone's home mm-hmm. uh, is it's it's strangely rude. Yeah. And so I kind of like stuck with this and I had it so like he could kind of feel something creeping up on him, but he wasn't sure. And maybe, you know, he was just freaking himself out. And then, you know, untimely demise because something wasn't creeping up behind him. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So I really, I've always been interested in that aspect of the ways that we will endanger ourselves to um, kind of participate in social expectations. Yeah. And the internet, I think, is the most fascinating kind of encapsulation of the way in which we do this. So things like, Uh, With streaming, you see stuff as simple as like the 24-hour streams that a lot of streamers will do. Uh, That's not good for your health. And I say that as a lifelong insomniac. I've Mm -hmm. I've pulled many 24, 48-hour, you know, runs in my life. But intentionally staying awake for 24 hours just to impress people or to get subs or make money. Um, is it's indicative of the way that people are choosing to damage themselves in order to pursue social credit. Mm -hmm. And so like there's other things like YouTuber pranks that um, are damaging to other people or themselves. There's a lot of YouTubers who have killed themselves accidentally trying to do dumb videos for likes. Um, Even things like people trying to take selfies from Instagram and accidentally backing up over the edge of the cliff that they have photographing themselves on uh this has been quite a few of those there's a uh there's a famous section of grant the grand canyon in america if you're familiar with that landmark Mm -hmm. um that people usually go to because it's all the movies are like they go to that same spot so there's like a thousand american movies that have like a shot right there at the grand canyon and so many people were falling off of it that they put up a chain and then so many people were stepping over the chain to get the chain out of the photograph that they removed the chain and just put up a bunch of signs like, you are going to die. Don't go past <laughs> this thing. Like, you will, you will just die. Like, I think it says, uh, basically it said something along the lines of, at one point, like 25 people die in uh, the national park system every year and 20 of them are because they fall off of like this cliff. And it was like so bad for a while, (laughs) especially at the beginning of the like Instagram, you know, thing like when people were doing it, doing it for the gram like 10 years ago. Oh, the selfie sticks. Yeah. And they just, you just, you keep backing up and then all of a sudden you're like, well, this is, this is a once in a lifetime shot, you know? (laughs) All the way down to the yeah. ground, literally. Yes, <laughs> but um, um, yeah. yeah. So that self endangerment aspect, uh, and and probably also, uh, and I don't know if I'm I'm speaking for your game, but I would have to assume because it's social media that uh, that sort of addictive nature. You know, that everybody, especially um, once you're once you start seeing them, that notification. If you become a notification junkie. Uh, oh, I got 32. Oh, I got 52. I got to see what this person's mm-hmm. comment. I got to see what I got, I got likes on. Oh, I didn't get enough likes on that. Should I adjust it? You know, do, are, you, are you trying to get stuff like that into this game? Yeah, absolutely. So awesome. that's like definitely a big part of it. And this exploration is um, kind of one of the taglines for the game is uh, something like what lengths will you go to for fame? And so... We really want to explore these kinds of um, sacrifices people will make. So what sacrifices will you make of yourself, of your body, of your mental health in order to pursue like online fame? Um, But also kind of how will you change? What kind of person will you become in pursuit of this? And so that's a really big, 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 big driving part of the game is um, really engaging with meaningful change and meaningful character development. So everything you experience in the game will actually change your character permanently. 
Um, so that's kind of where the RPG stuff comes in. Your character has all these different stats they have. Uh, and they also have things that we call tags, which are basically hashtags. And you can get tagged with all sorts of different things as a result of your experiences or your choices. And they will influence your stats, your mood, uh, and various other mechanics in the game. Nice. So, yeah, so cool. the game is really uh, keeping track of the way that you are sculpting yourself in the choices that you're making as you go through, as well as kind of the things that happen to you and the way you respond to them. And this seems pretty approachable, just in disguise. You're not going to have to be a, uh, you know, um, get the full Xbox controller out here and, and, and be using claw grip and stuff type things. Um, <laughs> do, do you have like an age range that you're really trying to specifically push for this game or, or a skill or demographic that you're trying to go for? Uh, it, honestly, not at all. Like I'm very much, I'm like the, the artist, not the, the kind of corporate marketing person. I'm kind of just of the approach that like if you like it it's for you if this speaks to you it's your thing um it it's for anyone who wants it anyone who responds i personally was reading stephen king when i was six i was also reading a whole bunch of other stuff like raunchy crazy like gothic romance incest novels and all sorts of madness <laughs> uh, stuff most people wouldn't let their children uh engage with you know child's play so like the chucky movie mm -hmm. uh was also my favorite movie when i was six i actually had a chucky doll uh and it was my prized possession so i was literally that little six-year-old girl wandering around holding you know by the hand um so I bring all that up because, you know, people say stuff like, oh, horror isn't for this or like this thing isn't for people like you. Mm -hmm. uh, and like feeling that sense of erasure in my life, especially, you know, it's not tied to like being an artist or being in horror. Even, you know, something that comes up in my life a lot is growing up, I was always called a tomboy. And that, always infuriated me because I was like, why can't I be a girl and love climbing trees and fighting, playing video games and scary things? Like, why does that have implications of masculinity? Uh, so yeah, I really, I am of the inclusive approach where it's kind of like, I'm going to make this thing that brings me joy. And if you see it and it brings you joy too, I want you to share that with me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And um, I think that kind of gets into a good uh, transition. As you said, you're the artist here. You're, you're wearing a lot of hats on this project uh, uh, in a very impressive amount of hats, which, you know, kind of goes with the, the, the territory when you're an indie game dev. <laughs> How did you learn to do all of this stuff? I know you have a degree in English, so writing's covered um but programming and artificial intelligence that's on a whole new level you know and then also you're doing <laughs> the art so if you don't mind uh, how do you how do you even get into that yeah well um to the surprise of many i am three so i if you see a photo of me people often assume i look younger um so i've had some some skills but you know first i want to throw out so uh right now our team is between five and six so while i do wear a lot of hats i'm not the sole programmer um much of the game was programmed by ryan Truk, and we also have a new programmer on board who helps us with bits and bobs um and we also have a writer who has come on board and his name is Matthew Hooten and he was actually uh, I met him because he was the lecturer in some creative writing courses I took in university during my English degree and he actually 
uh, supervised my English thesis, which I wrote on creepy pastas. And we worked so well on that thesis that as soon as we wrapped it up, I was like, hey, by the way, you want to come work on my video game? Um, but yeah, so I, I started very young on some of these skills. Um, I think I taught myself to code web pages. So like HTML and CSS when I was about nine, uh, Neopets got me into it actually. Oh no. People, yeah. You're a Did Neopets a hacker. Of, oh God. Oh, yeah. I didn't know I was in the presence of I royalty. I banned from <laughs> Neopets because I had like auto clickers going to like oh, yeah. game the system. It was great. I'm um, I'm 35 myself, uh, and, and Neopets, and there's a few other ones that are sort of like it were really popping off when I was in high school, and like some kids were like on a certain p- path in life, and then they discover <laughs> Neopets, and then they're like, oh, like uh, actually, I'm a black hat hacker right now. I'm making money <laughs> selling like pictures of of like little like donkey bird mixes oh, on the internet. Yeah. Like what, man? The like, original like, NFT. <laughs> really, the original NFTs, and they made people a lot of money. <laughs> They did. I wish I had been like financially savvy back then because, yeah, oh, yeah, I uh, I raked in some good stuff with my horrible, immoral system hacking. Oh, yeah. Uh, Not, you know, I'm smart. Definitely not hacking. Definitely just figuring out you could use auto clickers and open 200 different web pages and scroll them all. Um, but yeah, so I was really enchanted with the way people were customizing their like near pet sites. So I was like, how do they do that? And then I very quickly, I think maybe through near pets, I'm not sure. Um, I discovered GeoCities, which mm-hmm. in my mind is one of the greatest human creations and cultures of all time. I am the, the biggest GeoCities fan you'll ever meet. And you can see that inspiration in Dark Web Streamer. So much of the design of Dark Web Streamer, particularly the internet design, is absolutely driven by trying to recreate GeoCities. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so, uh, nine with HTML, CSS stuff. And then a natural progression of making my own web pages was wanting to make my own graphics for my own web pages. So I got a pirated copy of Photoshop. Um, yes, we kids learned piracy young back in the day. Oh, yeah. All those sweet, sweet video games we couldn't afford, but we had to have. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're in, you were in Australia too. You're like, if people don't oh, know, yeah. Australia jacks the price of video games up like 40 50 bucks over the cost of them in america even back in the 2000s i remember the first time i heard about it i was stunned there's somebody's like uh i think it was um that that zombie game where you take pictures uh in in in, on the xbox dead something i can't remember but it Mm -hmm. takes place in the mall and it came out, and I was like, "Oh yeah, this is." Oh, cool. it's not like Stubbs the Zombie. Or I um, I I think it might just be like Dead Rising. It doesn't make exactly. Oh, Dead Rising. Um, but yeah, it was like it was like the big release of that year, and I remember um, a bunch of Australian people were pissed on the internet, and I actually saw them. They're like, first off, it costs ninety dollars, like us, to get this thing, and also we can't see red blood. Like I'm stealing it, and like this whole big <laughs> thing came up where people were buying the American copies and shipping them uh, to like illegal, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> redistribution points in, in New South Wales or whatever. And then people were like doing like this whole like little black market just so people could see like red blood in video games instead of like the green or, or whatever. I, I, I saw it from a distance. so insulting. <laughs> How dare you infantilize us? Which is us Australians being irrevocably traumatized by the shade of the liquid <laughs> on the screen. Terrible. Oh, oh, yeah, it's it's been rough here for a long time. Like I remember 20 years ago, uh, 
the games cost over a hundred dollars, maybe like a hundred thirty. That's like occasionally, depending where you bought it from. So, yeah, it's it's been rough out here, and Australian kids, or at least you know my friends, were well versed in illegal means of acquisition. I actually, I am a huge, huge supporter of piracy and pirating things. Hey, um, all right. <laughs> So I'm trying really hard. We're publisher talks right now. I'm trying to preserve our uh, right to distribute dark web streamer over piracy networks um, without, you know, throwing up roadblocks because I believe piracy is the great class equalizer. I think that, you know, it, whether you can experience culture, which is really what art is, it's what games are, which I believe games are art. Um, but I don't think that it's right or moral for people to be paywalled out. Uh, I grew up a poor kid. There was no way that I, you know, there's no way I would be here today talking to you if I hadn't had piracy at my fingertips. Uh, when I was young, so I, you know, I want to kind of kick that forward to the next generation. I think it's really important we acknowledge that not everyone has the same mean, and it doesn't mean they don't deserve to participate. No, I, I actually I agree a hundred percent. Not to get in any way, shape, or form political, but like. Uh, you know, it's like um, a library is is where I always I was a library kid because I I was growing I grew up broke as hell too um, out mm -hmm. here in America, and so if I wanted a book, even you know I'm, you're going to the library. I'm reading old stuff, and you know I'm a writer now, and that's how I make my money. And I wouldn't have that if I didn't have the library. But for whatever reason, you know, there isn't a, a, a powerful equivalent of a library for games and there very much well should be because, and, and this is something that should be really explicitly said, a lot of video games are vanishing. Like mm -hmm. if somebody out there didn't collect a cartridge of a certain game in 1987, it might be gone forever for better or for worse. And yeah, absolutely. These, these companies are not making a, a, a way to play the original version of that game. You know, I don't want the, I don't want the redone version of Wind or of Wind Waker or or of uh, uh, you know the old um, uh, a Link to the Past. I, I want to play a Link to the Past and all of its glory. I will find a CRT TV just for the the, <laughs> the fuzzy blur. You know what I'm saying? And, and they don't have something like that except for except for piracy and people and people hacking ROMs and just putting that stuff up there. If you want to play. Yeah, uh, had they not metro. done that back in the day, like, we would have nothing today. No. So many games would be gone. We were just uh, having a little discourse on the simulation game Black and White that was produced by Peter Molyneux of Fable fame. Um, I forget what else he did now. I always just think of Fable and Black and White. I think he did Spore, didn't he? Uh, oh, oh. Was that Will Wright or Peter Molyneux? I, I can't oh, it's remember. Such a it's, disappointment. It's, it's that same. I was so vibe. excited for it. Spore. <laughs> yeah. Spore. I knew. It, I it just it like logically couldn't live up to how great of an idea it was, and like, and I'm glad I didn't get too excited about it because my friend got it um, right off the bat, and like he paid full price for it and got all it, and then he's just like, man, I made a, I made basically, I made an animal. It's a walking dick. And I think I've done everything that you could ever do yeah. in this game. <laughs> that was essentially my experience. <laughs> yeah, I heard someone gives it another shot and does it right this time. Um, but yeah, so like black and white is just this absolutely incredible, incredible game. No one has ever made another game like it. And what really makes it so special essentially uh it's a god simulation game so like you are a god 
uh, not you know any particular religion. It's just like you're kind of either an evil god or a benevolent god or whatever. And they're you like big choose. furry monsters, right? Yes, they're called creatures. And the creature was really like the glory of black and white in terms of design and player experience because the creature, uh, you chose them at the beginning and they were kind of like having this like really intelligent dog that could like do a lot of stuff and interact uh with the world around them and so you as the player um you were playing as the god and your job was to get followers because the more people believed in you the stronger you were as a god the more kind of like power you held the power of belief and so you would kind of use your creature to do physical interactions in the world. Um, but your creature was not just a puppet. Your creature was kind of like a very AI being who had a mind of their own and had agency of their own. So you could kind of try to like convince them to do things or kind of train them to do things so they could do stuff like pick up things they could pull trees out of the ground and move them over to villages and replant them they could cast various spells so they could cast grain spells to feed hungry villages cast water spells to put out fires things like this um, they could also go dark side and begin to smack villages around or eat them and inspire fear in the village. Uh, so, like, it was really great because sometimes you'd be trying really hard to be essentially a benevolent god, which the game recognized. Um, but you would just kind of have this evil creature sometimes. I don't really, I don't know what the mechanics behind it was, but sometimes you just got a bad egg of a creature and they would go and, like, eat villages like all the time while you were trying to convince them you were very nice and um so yeah and i bring this up because to me it's like truly one of the greatest most creative games ever made and you cannot play it anymore there is no like place where you can acquire it legally the only way to play it is to pirate it uh, and even that's a rough time. So I just mm. think, like, what what have we lost, and what might we have lost? Yeah, it it it, it sucks that uh, that that becomes a thing. You know, like you, you can just you can just lose such an important game. Because I always wanted to play black and white. I actually came out. I was in the military, and um, I didn't have a good enough laptop because I <laughs> you can't have a desktop. So and my laptop wasn't strong enough to play it. I bought a no. copy, carried it around oh, with me no. all, for two years, basically, in my luggage. Oh, wow. Never got to install it on anything, and I finally sold it for, like, five bucks. So somewhere oh, out no. there, there's a, there's there was, you know, I had a, a whole boxed copy of this. Tied unused. black and white. <laughs> yeah, and it's it, it was gone. I never got to play. And now, you know, hey, maybe I, I never really will. When you brought it up, I saw you brought that up on Twitter. I was just like, oh, God, no. No, <laughs> all the memories rushing back. Um, but on that note, yeah. it's a it's a good transition into uh, what what are your like legacy um, horror games? If you had to pick like a good uh, a good solid handful uh, to take with you somewhere. Oh, that's a good question. Um, the first game that comes to mind is John Saul's Blackstone Chronicles. That the Blackstone Chronicles sounds vaguely familiar, but I can't quite put my hand on it. Yeah, I've it's one of their that I've met another person who has played them. But this game absolutely floored me. It essentially takes place in an asylum. Uh so like an old school psychiatric asylum. Um, but it's not functioning anymore. It's being turned into a museum. And you play as a father whose son has been like taken by this 
ghost, this like demonic ghost in the asylum. And so as you go through the asylum, such you're wandering into different rooms in the asylum and you're experiencing kind of like spirit flashbacks of things that happen to people in this place. And it's just, it's incredibly well done in terms of, I think it was an FMV game. Um, oh, so FMV and, games. Talk about oh, huge, huge gone. fan of the FMV. Um, but yeah, so like the thing that really, that I took to about it was it was actually a really empathetic portrayal of the patients in this asylum so you were watching them be subjected to things like shock therapy um and i believe there were like lobotomies and stuff so this game really took like the most horrible things that these old psychiatric asylums used to do to patients and showed them to kind of like the contemporary player and they didn't really do like the normal thing of turning the patients into the scary ones mm -hmm. uh, they weren't like oh look at these insane people and the scary things they do instead it really felt like a more empathetic look at like the horrible things that humans did to other humans like under the name of um normality and normalcy uh yeah like these kind of veins of uh cultural supremacy where mm -hmm. the psychiatrists are the ones who can tell you what is normal and what isn't normal and it's okay to be like this and it's not okay to be like this and it's totally okay for us to take out parts of your brain against your consent because we don't think you're normal enough you've got uh, a so real, i really love that you've got a real stylistic through line like all the way back <laughs> that sounds like that sounds almost like something you would make so that that that's cool to see that uh oh, um, sure. you know that kind of creative uh, uh seed being planted how old were you when you mm -hmm. played that game do you think uh i think it was nine. Oh hell yeah nine-year-olds yeah. in lobotomies <laughs> you're you're one yeah. of us <laughs> hell yeah i was way into it i like i love horror for so many reasons to me um horror is aesthetic shauna and so i really love empathetic horror because i think what horror does where you know no other genre kind of like dedicates itself to it is that horror is all about looking at the things that frighten us most as human beings and engaging with it and not turning away from it mm -hmm. uh, and most of what scares us is things that other human beings have gone through so you know like many people live the things that we are terrified of and so like when I talk about empathy, I talk about things like getting familiar with these really scary concepts and uh, experiences that other beings have and kind of by going through them in like these mediums, we kind of get an expanded perspective of what it means and what it's like to go through something horrifying and tragic and I think we can develop deeper senses of empathy for other people around us by not turning away from things that feel bad and scary. And instead, like they allow us to turn toward people who have gone through bad and scary things and kind of stand with them. Mm -hmm. Heck yeah. So that's just a, like, it's a perfect thought. I don't know how to follow that up. It was just such a great, that's a, that's a <laughs> mic dropper. <laughs> of a, of a, of an explanation. I really love that um that outlook on horror. It, it's pretty similar to my own um and it's one of my favorite ones. You know, I really I, I respect all of the reasons that people come to the genre. Um you know, uh, even if you're just like I'm a splatter punk guy, I want to see <laughs> exploding bodies on celluloid, you know what I mean? I respect mm -hmm. it, but I, I think even for uh those folks 
it really does come back to empathy a lot of the time, even if, you know, you're not necessarily uh, portraying empathy on the screen to a degree. It's even for them, you know, being able to feel empathy with other people because, you know, you can be like, Hey man, I'm in this theater. We're all the same sort of weirdo, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're kind of in this together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This, you know, there's a lot to say if it, being a weirdo, finding that fellow group of weirdos. It's, it's, it could be isolating. It's nice to find your people. And horror is a really great, like, we have such a good community, I think, because we all kind of like have that element of like, ooh, people are a little bit scared of us. Yeah. <laughs> but here are my people who understand me. I actually had. Uh, when I was like 12, I think I was in seventh grade and I was homesick one day and the next day I went to school and all these kids ran up to me, all my classmates. They, there was literally a line at my desk of fellow classmates and they all came up and they told me that when I was gone, our teacher had sat them down on the floor gathered them around and given them a a little talk about me <laughs> so yeah bizarre, terrible you're, preaching, bizarre. <laughs> you're preaching to the choir on that one. Oh my god oh, damn. all right it's not just me See, no, fellow no. theaters. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> we all find our, 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 our fellows in this don't we <laughs> yes we really do uh, like these crazy experiences and else <laughs> had actually yeah yeah that had people like so so what did she what did she say about you oh she basically the kind of like core of her talk was that you shouldn't listen to Chantal because (laughs) she has a dark mind that's awesome that's so so fucking cool though the dark mind that was like what she was very concerned about and she kind of talked about how it was very persuasive and blah 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 and like they cannot listen to me because of my dark mind now sway them to dark things and the reason she said this was um because you know i was a horror right (laughs) yeah and i constantly read horror novels it was a devout, upstanding Christian woman. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my. And, that's, so, yeah, that's such so a good that compliment, freaked, though. Yeah. I, I was touched. But, like, actually, it was really interesting because it set off this kind of journey of self-understanding for me where I, like, I heard that and I was like, do I have a dark mind? Like, what is a dark mind? What does it mean to have a dark mind? Mm -hmm. And I really, like, I sat with that and I chewed on that and I thought, like, why, like, why am I so interested in dark things? Why am I interested in violence and horror? And I think that was really kind of like the seed in which I came to my own self-awareness of what I love about horror. Mm -hmm. And that... I'm like, I don't love horror because I love bad things happening to people. I love horror because I'm actually, I'm a really kind of a good person. You know, it feels a bit weird to say, but I'm like, I'm very moral, ethics focused. And, you know, I'm always, I put a lot of, um, effort into like kindness and compassion. And I always have. So to me, I was really in why people did bad things to people. It was so beyond my, you know, like my natural inclinations. What drives people to hurt people? Like, what mm-hmm. what's going on here? Like, I don't understand it. And dinner, I'm a researcher to my core. So it's kind of become this lifelong quest to, it like going back to empathy to like empathize with even people who do bad things and be like, you know, what, what drove you to be this way? Like, could you have been another way? What would it take? Yeah. I think there's something to be said uh, with the horror genre in reaction and in regard to that, because 
that is uh, it, when you go to other genres, right? If you go to like you know the like the you know fancy crime movies, all that sort of stuff, the, the the best movies ever ever made <laughs> type stuff. You know, it's like you got to get to the peak of filmmaking to say like you know some people who are good people do bad things because of bad things that have happened to them in the past, and the people are like that's that's such characters. a profound yeah such a profound <laughs> message, and I'm like um I, I already knew that. <laughs> I'll see Friday the That's 13th. Kind of I know it's not always cut dry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, incredibly missed genre. I love, I don't actually, I hate, I hate when I'm talking to someone. I Like, I have a son, sir. I talk to a lot of, like, school moms is mm-hmm. the best way to put it. Uh, you know, like, very normal people living very lives and i'll meet you have a lot of morticia adams moments yes i do i really do i relate to her i related to wednesday so much as a kid and now i'm older so much to morticia oh my gosh (laughs) um but yeah i'll kind of like finally it'll come up that like i'm a horror writer i make horror i love movies and sometimes i just get this like this look And the look, it's like a, it's a disconnecting. They look Mm -hmm. at me and they begin to disconnect. And I can tell it's because they like, they get a little bit scared. This person likes hurting people. They like people being hurt, blah, blah, blah. Like I see that kind of uh, stereotype forming in their mind. And I see them get a little bit frightened of it and backpedal. Mm-hmm. And it sucks because, yeah, it's it's really the opposite. I just I I'm not afraid to engage with it. I'm compelled to engage with it. Yeah, I've uh, I've noticed that too. Um, I, I've made especially once COVID hit, uh, and you know now that that's kind of over, the just desire to not be in my goddamn house is <laughs> yes. like a, one of my biggest priorities any given day. And so I started going out to conventions and stuff, and um, you know doing things with uh, with my own work with West Side Fairy Tales. And so, you know, some of the the conventions I get to go to are horror conventions, which, you know, that's that's the people. But I also go to book conventions because I'm a writer and it's hilarious to see the difference between the two, because I'll go to the book conventions uh, <laughs> and and people come up and I'll be like, hey, so this is like a blah, blah, blah. My, my, my intro, I always have a I have a lead because I, I got a sales the elevator lead. pitch. As we call I, it. I, yeah, a real. I have a real elevator pitch. I'm pretty good at it, too. People like it. <laughs> uh, but I always start like, hey, do you like scary stories? And, you know, some people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And usually, you know, you can kind of get you can see our our people because they uh, I got like a little scary skull logo, which isn't that scary to me at all. <laughs> Even remotely, it's just a skull. But for other people, they're like. This is very intense. I don't know. I didn't I expect to get my blood pressure rise. And I'll ask them, like, do you like scary stories? And people are like, no, God. Whoa. Like, like the actual, like the yeah. full reaction. And I'm like, I didn't. It, it's so offensive <laughs> to them, Almer. Yeah. Like, I, I never, I never expected to see somebody get hit that hard with the question. Like, it's almost like a like cartoonish reaction. And, and, you know, yeah. No offense if that's. Well, there's no way that the, any of these people are listening to this specific yeah. podcast. But if, if you know someone like that, I, I don't be mean to them for it. You know, don't think less <laughs> of them. But it is a pretty funny, a pretty funny reaction. Oh, um, yeah, I experience the same thing when I go to horror conventions. I will be talking to people, especially like publishers. This happens with a lot. And I'll bring up that I make horror games and I'll have that same kind of like full body expulsion of like oh no not horror like i don't do i can't do horror no 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 like keep it away from me like i'm sorry i'll never play your game it's always like really like enthusiastically aggressive i'm like damn yeah. I, the, the, you know, just, a certain level of pride in avoiding me. it <laughs> It's when someone tells me that kind of like making like, you know, a romance visual novel, I'm like, oh, I'm never freaking out like, God, visual novels. Man, I would never play one of the, oh, you're making, you're making a romance story. (laughs) My God. You're making a a, a first person shooter? Oh, Jesus. Right? (laughs) You make games like kill people for fun. 
It, it's um. especially it would especially be odd too in like uh, uh, for a video game person to do that, considering how uh, respected horror titles are in video games compared to I think basically any other like mm-hmm. medium genre. Like you know, the horror tries to it, it, it does pretty good in. Uh, movies it's not the biggest thing at all in books but the best video games on most lists that are at the very top all have horror elements especially if you even go to triplet doom i mean first off (laughs) doom is like literally a horror game in hell silent hill 2 one of the best like narrative horror uh products that have ever existed five nights at freddy's Mm -hmm. is like the most successful franchise i think that's ever existed that was created by just a dude in his bedroom oh, dude i sir i've gone to europe uh recently a couple of times for game conventions and um i've noticed all around like different countries in europe when you'll go to like like a convenience store or a little kind of they have little trolleys that have you know drinks and cigarettes or whatever uh they have is a oh my god what's it called it's like happy friends or something do you know what i'm talking about yes i know yeah the blue thing yeah with like the big smile yeah 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 that's uh that yeah. just came out soon there's that's that game is a demo i don't know if you knew that Really? No, it's, it's I didn't. That big. They have like literally the the stuffed toys of like those game characters all over Europe. I, I had I do not know. It breaks my brain. You can hear my brain breaking. I the, to engage with the why. Yeah. Of why this obscure horror game character is in convenience stores in many different countries. <laughs> I don't know how that one got that how big. How did that happen? Um, but that's, uh, I don't know if you've, if you've heard, I know you're in the industry, but like this is super ridiculously niche. And I only just heard it the first time from another game developer like uh, a couple weeks ago. And that's called mascot horror. If you've heard that oh. yet, it's that no, whole no show. It's a whole subgenre of fairly intense horror games targeted two kids under 12 ish. So they like, there's basically like no cussing. There might be adult themes, but they're generally hidden. And so it's like Bendy and the ink machine, five nights at Freddy's, um, that game, uh, the happy, f- happy fun time friends or whatever it is. And then there's another one that's coming out, uh, where all of the enemies are basically, uh, like, um, Sesame street puppets. And you have a, you have like a gun, but it shoots like letters because it's like a typewriter gun. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're kind of like wacky and stuff. And they, they sell merchandise around these games. I think that's why people are getting into it. But that one that you brought up is only, it's a, a a, a beta release. Um, You know, we're finishing it as we go type game. And it's only got two chapters out, which I think approximate a total, a total playtime of like, half an hour to maybe 45 minutes. And if you're sprinting through it, I think it's like two or three, you know what I mean? Like, like um, speed runners. Just wild. Yeah. And I, I'm I like, thought, who, who are these people? How are they getting them in I, like convenience stores? And can you please tell me how? <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it's gotta be some sort of development deal maybe or something. But, uh, so a lot of times they work with those, um, you know, they send out feelers to like the live stream people, like the Markiplier type yeah. dudes and they blow stuff up. But that one, especially I thought it was a finished game because I was seeing plushies. I was like, you know, Oh, Hey, <laughs> well, this looks like it's kind of, it could be fun to check out. And then it's like, Hey, yo, this is a, this is a demo only. And I'm clicking around steam for 15 minutes. Like, okay, well stop showing me the demo page. Show me <laughs> the finished product page. Like, nope. <laughs> sorry, bud. It, it's this, but Hey, Chapter two coming out in a like month. We like we made our money. We <laughs> got our match. We don't have to make the whole game now. That dude's, a, that dude's in Maui right now, just like on a beach. Like, oh man, am I almost out of my millions of dollars from selling <laughs> plush toys? Better go crank out a third chapter. Dude, I'm like, hit me up. Tell me secrets. Like, 
inquiring minds need to know. Oh, I know. I do. I, I don't like, it's just, uh, th- that's the thing, you know, I, I know I make a good product, but like, um, just sometimes the, just the cruel luck of <laughs> algorithms and, uh, influencer culture just allows you to like become something else. Like, Hey man, uh, I don't know. Some guy named, you know, monkey foot toenail 33 found your game and talked about it. And, uh, you, you need to hire an accountant because there's <laughs> millions of dollars in it's multiple currencies money. coming. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. It's, it's really wild. I mean, bring up into influence the culture with coming back full circle yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to dog web streamer. Well, like, yeah, i have just, these are the kinds of things that are like really interesting and in that, um, you know, I, what I love about dog web streamer, not to toot our own horn, uh, is just that we've kind of created like narrative sandbox uh, the whole game is procedurally generated. So every single time you play, you get a totally different story. And uh, all the events are basically procedurally generated as well. So not only do you get random events every time you play, those events themselves are randomized based on the AI, um, which, you know, to go way back and answer your question, you know, how did I get to programming AI actually? Uh, the the language generation was more of a linguistic theory. So it's kind of like me being a writer and coming up with this system in which I thought I could kind of uh, procedurally populate dialogue that always made sense and I actually mm-hmm. learned to code uh, backend, so like backend programming, so not, you know, web dev html css but uh i do all my work in python actually like literally went and learned to code that so i kind of like was theory first and then programming second and luckily you know it all worked out um but yeah so like that is how all of uh that generation ended up being made so yeah like in dark web streamer essentially every time you play you're getting really unique events happening to you. And the beauty of that is we can really just explore whatever aspect of influencer culture and internet culture we like, because we kind of just like can write various events in that just spend their time exploring that one aspect. So yeah, we can kind of like go anywhere and engage with anything. It's just really a matter of writing kind of like a sequence of explorations in around particular topics. And speaking of particular topics, um, I know it's like uh, you, you, you are unfortunately accomplishing a lot of great things uh, in AI at the absolute worst time <laughs> to have that uh, those two letters be trending on the yes. internet. Um, do, do you want to kind of, um, because actually my last conversation with somebody was about uh, uh, AI and the generative aspect of like uh, stable diffusion, art creative or art mosh, whatever. Um, can you kind of talk about like what you're making and why that's different from like somebody just using chat GPT to populate a game and they just literally turn it on and throw it at the game? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it definitely has been really painful because we've been in development uh, nearly, I don't know, a little over two years now. And the AI part came very, very, very early into development. Uh, I actually led uh, what was called the Digital Humanities Project at my university, the University of Adelaide, four or five years ago. I've actually always been really into AI ever since I was quite young. Uh, some of my favorite games are games like the game Creatures, which... Uh, They called it an A-life game, so an artificial life game. It was made by a biologist and roboticist, uh, Steve Grant. And it went into, uh, essentially, they made a rudimentary brain and chemicals for these little artificial creatures. 
it, it, like it was a full game. So you played on your computer and they had all sorts of like behaviors that they could learn that were reinforced by these virtual chemicals that would happen in response to environmental stimuli. Um, so I love playing with that. I love playing with chatbots, blah, blah, blah. I've always been interested in that when the kind of like Google art AI came out many years ago, something like nine or 10 years ago now, I was one of the earliest users. Mm-hmm. I was very, very different back then. It wasn't kind of taking people's art and, um, you know, spitting them out. It was very much kind of random pixel generation and things would emerge. Uh, yeah. And then I led the digital humanities project at my university, which was really just looking at how cutting edge machine learning uh, technologies could apply to humanity subjects. So a lot of kind of applications for uh, doing things like passing novels and like whole bodies of authors' work or genres or um, scanning letters, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of letters to mm-hmm. pick up information that the human mind wouldn't have been able to pick up in a lifetime, all this kind of thing. So I learned a lot of different kind of AI techniques and possibilities doing that. Uh, So when I came to dark web, I had this kind of level of understanding of what's possible in the space and also kind of all this knowledge of ways that people before me had tackled AI in games. So we brought up black and white, um, how it had these artificial intelligence creatures, all this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So... I started essentially hand-making our AI, and that is fundamentally how it is different to the uh, the tragic misuse of the term AI today. AI is a very, very, very exceptionally broad field. Yes. Um, and, you know, I prefer using the, the term GPT technology or... Um, a large language model of technology for the actual like issues that people are having today, um, which is the kind of like predictive model AI approach. Uh, so we don't use predictive models. We don't use large language models in our game. What we use is a whole bunch of smart uh, kind of grammatical structuring and many many, many, freakishly many handmade, handwritten lists of things. Um, I can't get too much into how it all works just because I'd be here for a long time. But essentially, we don't take anyone's work. Uh, Everything that our AI generates comes from our team or occasionally from um, kind of like public use uh, what's the time like creative commons or mm-hmm. uh, data sets that people have compiled um, and even that uh, has become a little messy lately so uh, data mining has so like what data mining is is essentially just getting lots of web pages and kind of accumulating all the words on those web pages and then having a script runner for them to find out stuff like how frequent does this word appear? What are the most common words um, appearing over these things? What words are associated with others? Mm -hmm. Um, That's always seemed fairly benign. It's something like a human could do. It would just take a really, really long time. And humans have been doing it since before uh, computers existed. Um, So like, very occasionally we do have stuff like, uh, you know, we'll use a list of 100,000 nouns that somebody put together for us because we don't have the oh, yeah. the bandwidth to go. <laughs> I appreciate how much know, this has months. put you on the back foot as a creator, um, oh, which, is, which, is, which really does show that you're, you're, you're trying to do your due diligence. Um, for sure. It's a whole different. Two years ago. People were so excited and, you know, people are still really excited about what we're doing. But um, actually, I 
part of why I got into games was to make the things that I thought games would be when I grew up and that they never came to be. Mm-hmm. So I thought that I would be talking to the AI and they would be talking back and kind of understanding me. Um, you know, I'm I'm an extrovert. I really wanted that for me. <laughs> so yeah, I like I kind of set out to make a game that felt like it was understanding what you were uh, talking about with it and that gave you characters that felt like they had you and kind of could have a um so yeah that was like where kind of like the ai segment came from and uh we started doing it in a way that no one's ever done it before so a dwarf fortress and caves of cod are um you know good examples of procedural generation and procedurally generated language dwarf fortress scares me oh yeah it's i'm really glad they came out with a graphic open it up to a lot of people um but like what doc web streamer does is uh it's similar in some ways but it's very different in others particularly with its focus on uh conversation and dialogue and talking back and forth and um focusing on what characters have to say uh it does also kind of procedurally generate the world around you and events etc like Uh, the other games but yeah we I think we have that focus on interpersonal exchange more than um, any other game has really done that language generation Uh, yeah people it was fine it was all good (laughs) and now we've kind of got pulled into this big debate over like Mm -hmm. oh this game uses AI this game uses generated dialogue instead of pre-written dialogue. And I'm like, dude, I'm a writer. Like, yeah. I I am not the enemy. I am a writer who wrote AI to um, help me write things that I, like, you're physically incapable of writing without using these techniques. And that's what's so exciting about them. Um, this, I've always called this game essentially a creative writing project. Yeah. Uh, it is looking at like what we can do with story beyond linear, linear. I think I just made up a word that doesn't exist. What is that? <laughs> linear, at, linearity. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just rolling with it. That That's a thing now. Uh, Linear, so uh, the the quality linearity. Yeah, I, I think sir. That, I think that's a word. Linearity. I'm like liminality. <laughs> liminality is for sure a word. Oh yeah, liminality is, which I'm also very into liminality. But yeah, like basically, you know, you've got a story, you write it, and it goes from point A to point B, and then it's mm-hmm. done. Whereas I was like, what if you could understand story so well? that you could make a story, right? It's earned story. Like what would I have to know about story in order to like get a story that understands itself so well it can write itself? Like what Mm -hmm. does that take? That's kind of like how everything grew. That isn't, that's an interesting thing. You know, I think that that's really um, the two sides of this, of this, this AI thing, which is the, the very much, Mostly, I believe people, especially in the uh, the creative, like we're making the AI aspect, is people trying to create a very powerful tool. And when you when you see a tool used, um, it, it is always this, uh, you know, is it being used for the right way or the wrong way? So I think um, one of the biggest questions is: this is a lot of work. Uh, what's your roadmap on? Uh, looking like for dark web streamer and um, and getting it uh, to become a finished product that you know we can all we can all get out there and play. Yeah, um, it's that's always a tricky question because this is our it's our first radio. I hear with many other radios, never really know how long it will take. Uh, I'm definitely the kind of dev that is like, it is done when it's done. It's cooked when it's cooked. Uh, we're not going to try to kill ourselves or 
uh, you know, risk delivering a product we're not proud of in order to meet dates or I give it maybe like 18 months um, is kind of what we're shooting for and the 2024 maybe. Um, but we are still, you know, like people have played the game. Uh, we have community play tests every so often. We likely release a demo far sooner than that. Um, so we're not completely out of everyone's hand. Another asks more, how bad do you want it? Because you can come hang out and kind of play the early version if you're super enthusiastic about it. We are very community fast. We love our people. We love our horror people. We love our game people. Uh, we've got a really cool community over at Discord. Um, we have a Discord server for Dark Web Streamer. And yeah, we kind of, we're all friends there in a way. Like if you're into the game, you're already my And yeah, so we'll kind of just occasionally be like, hey guys, here's a new version of the game that we'd love for you to test and give us your feedback. And we do tend to implement a lot of the feedback we get. Or even, you know, people just kind of have a batshit idea and be like, you know, it would be great if you could have a cooking stream. And I'll be like, holy shit, a cooking stream. Never thought about that. That's the thing now. The people always want a cooking stream, don't they? And if somebody wants, yeah. if somebody wants a cooking stream, where where can we find you? And where can we find uh, dark web stream, <laughs> the dark web cooking stream? Where will I cook? Uh, primarily uh, is on Twitter. So we are at dark web streamer on Twitter, and I am at thought rice. Also on Twitter, uh, we do have a vaguely broken website over at darkwebstreamer.com. Maybe keep an eye on it because I will be updating it soon. And we may or may happening. I may or may not have soon websites across the Tor network or the dark web as people might know it um so you know we we like to play games over here and there are games for people to play even before dark web's out uh so yeah awesome oh, i also i also have a podcast uh that we recently released called directional and that is hosted with my friend and game designer, Jörg Tittle. And we talk about video games and the creative rebellion. So how do we make games better? Awesome. Well, everybody, thanks a bunch, Chantel Ryan, for coming out. Dark web streamer, 18 months Maybe more, maybe less. Maybe you're already playing it right now. If you're on the internet, the game already has you. You've been sucked in. You didn't even know it. This was this was the infection point. Uh, thanks again for coming out and talking to me, Chantel. You've been amazing. This was a great conversation. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in to another episode of the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and lit club this is another interview series today with Chantel ryan if you want to learn more about Chantel or her game dark web streamer please go to twitter check out at thought rise that's Chantel's personal um handle and uh the at dark web streamer um handle that's 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 the uh the twitter page for her game she's also the host of uh directional show and um, you can find out more about that on twitter as well at directional show um if you guys enjoy this please share this if you are liking the interview series getting to meet um sort of my curated uh upcoming not upcoming but like my my curated uh list of of people that i find on the internet that i find to be fascinating please 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 um tell me tell me in the the description of the episodes tell me in person if you want to reach out and contact us we are West Side Fairy Tales everywhere, basically, except for Twitter. 
Facebook.com, Westside Fairy Tales, Horror and Dark Fiction Podcast, same as Instagram, same as Threads, because it's all one goddamn company. I'm at Westside Tyler. If you want to see my TikToks, and uh, we are at WS Fairy Tales on Twitter. But most importantly, you can find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Westside Fairy Tales for ad free episodes, for early episodes, for merch for behind the scenes information for big lore dumps from the regular episodes on the feed. You can find all of that and more at patreon.com slash West side fairy tales. And like I was saying before, before the end of the year, we want to get this up to a hundred. If you know a place that you want to share this program to and be like, Hey, I know somewhere that needs fucking patrons right now. I want a place to build them up. They're fucking cool. Share the West side fairy tales, wherever you are. If you're new to the program, welcome. If you've been here forever, thank you so fucking much for putting up with me. Please, 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 please keep your heads up, your ears out, your eyes open for the upcoming Kickstarter launch of my debut novel, West by God, in which we follow the uh, the exploits of a young female reporter named Adelaide who is trying to get to the bottom of a seemingly solved, but in her mind, possibly still open murder mystery in a quiet mountain town in West Virginia. This is, um, this is a big project. I have been, I finished writing this like almost half a decade ago, maybe a more than half a decade ago. And, uh, it's definitely some of the tightest writing I've ever done. It's been looked at, gone over, poured through, but yeah, you've got to get out there. You've got to check it out. That is West by God. It will be getting a Kickstarter, uh, launch, in July, that will be July 28th to August, I believe, uh, 16th. That's going to be about three weeks, right? A three-week-long Kickstarter. We're trying to raise money. If we get enough money, we're going to get original artwork for the cover from Yui. If not, we're going to make do with some great shit that we'll find otherwise. So we're trying to make, uh, we're, we're trying to fucking get as many people as we can in on this Kickstarter. So spread it far, spread it wide. If you're out there and you're like, you know, someone who's just, I want to read a horror story, but I want to read one from a veteran. Boom. You've got it. I want to read a a, a mystery murder mystery type story, but I want to read it. And it's set in West Virginia. Boom. We got you. Hey, I want some like twin peaks action, but I don't want it to feel like it's an actual, just direct rip off of twin peaks. Boom. We fucking got you. It's everything. It's everywhere. And it's not too long. Unlike everything else I make. It's about the length of the second Harry Potter book. So you'll be able to chomp into this one, rip it to pieces in a weekend and be talking about with your friends almost immediately afterwards. West by God. It is a by God, good goddamn book. And it will be out there. If you guys help us Kickstarter it, please, 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 please. This is the one thing I'm really, really, really going to ask you for. If you've been holding off, ever trying to help out the podcast or anything, you're like, I don't know exactly what I want to do. This is what I need you to do. Maybe not even necessarily give us some money, but for sure, for sure, share this Kickstarter everywhere you can, especially if you are anywhere near any horror groups, any read along groups, book studies, anything like that. If you know librarians, if you know booksellers, Every single person that you think you could spread this to, please. We're trying to make this as big as possible. This could take the West Side Fairy Tales to the next level. This could take me maybe a little bit more mainstream, maybe enough so that um, we can we can start doing some even bigger projects. I mean, just imagine seeing uh, the old WSF Rose Skull logo popping up for two seconds. Uh, before the beginning of like a Netflix show. How fucking cool would that be? If you guys help me. Then we fucking get it out there and we build up this audience. We can fucking do it. We can do it together, guys. We can do it fucking together. I have infinite faith in you all um, and, and, and sub infinite faith in myself. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to just reiterate again. If you guys ever want to get a hold of me, westsidefairytales at gmail.com, any of the aforementioned social media sites, and uh, keep your eyes up for the Kickstarter launch and for a new episode of Sin Carriers, that would be episode 13, Swamp, coming very, 
very soon. This is a this is a pretty good one. This is one of like it's hard it's hard to say it's going to be the best one so far because you guys the the last episode pretty much goes hard. I could have probably just dropped the mic on that one and everyone would be like, "Oh man, I can't wait for the sequel." And maybe I should have split this into two halves because this is only halfway. You're only a little bit more than halfway through the story. And there's just like another chunk of it. But I, I digress. I digress. Please hop in, pop in, sub, share everything. I love you guys. And until next time, as always, stay safe out there. I'm Joe Hamia. And I'm James Walton. We're here to tell you that the Booker Prize is launching a brand new podcast. Each week, Joe and I will be plucking novels from the Booker archives to review, ponder, and in some cases, almost fight about. Almost. <laughs> we'll be having a gossip about all things Booker. Sometimes with the help of special guests. Give me the good stuff, James. What's it called? We've decided to call it uh, the Booker Prize Podcast. <laughs> and it'll be available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So look out for Booker Prize Podcasts and please do follow the show.